nearly as great as, say, the seven and a half to one. But that, for, to me, is sort of, it's almost uninteresting to me what happens in the criminal justice system to send people to prison. It's much more interesting to me what happens in society to send people to prison. Because I think there are only two possible theories. I mean, again, there are lots of variants. But either we have a racist society, which creates the conditions that lead to imprisonment, or black people are genetically predisposed to commit crime. Now, there's not too many people left, fortunately, who believe the second. So even if black people go to prison more because they commit more crime, and that's what Nagel was saying, you know, what kind of society do we have that leads to that situation? I mean, I've shown you the data, which, you know, which are really true. Uh, a black person in this country is almost twice as likely to go to prison as a black person in South Africa. I mean, imagine, you know, what, what does that say about our society? Yeah, one question, then, yeah. Yes, please. Okay, um, now I, I've done a lot of reading on, on this, not just on this topic, but on kind of discrimination in general. And um, I, I think a couple points that, that would have been nice if you could have raised the fact that if a, a white person kills a black person, the type of crime he's charged with. Because for instance, in New York, when those five teenagers killed that one black guy, they were charged with something like involuntary manslaughter. Okay, now if that had been five black guys after one white guy, they all of them would have got charged with first degree murder. Right. Okay, right. then <clears throat> if you look at the type of crime that a black is charged with, he commits a crime against another black person. It's also relatively a minor crime. So that means it's encouraged for blacks to kill blacks, for whites to kill blacks. However, if you look at the type of crime that a black person is charged with, if he commits a crime against a white person, it's much, much more severe, you know, and pretty more, more likely to get even the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I, I've done a lot of research on that sort of thing, and I know that the, that's, that is a fact, and that's true. Right. That's from mm -hmm. all levels. Right, it is. It's, it, um, that's a great point. It's just, you know, I feel bad about bombarding people with just, just so, such a huge amount of data. I mean, the, the one crime that's been studied the most careful, of course, is the death penalty. And it's been found over and over and over again that, that there's an enormous amount of racism present. Even the most recent ruling, the Supreme Court even said, I mean, this is, you know, Reagan and Reagan's court, but the, the Supreme Court said, yes, it's, you know, it's racist, but we have to go on. And, and that, I mean, they, they said that verbatim or, you know, almost verbatim in their decision. I mean, the, the ruling was not challenged. Someone submitted a big research project and they found that for exactly identical cases, um, if you killed a, 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 black, a white person, you were four times more likely to get the death penalty than if you killed a black person. And, uh, and that's, you know, different variants of that have been found constantly. And that, I think, is the most, of course, the best studied uh, crime. Yes? Yeah, I've got a whole list of things here, but I, my first is, what's the title of your presentation? What? what? Was the title of your presentation that you started to hear tonight? Oh, uh, the, the title was The True Purpose of the Criminal Justice System. Okay, well, that's different than what we saw on the walls. Um, my, my, my next, it was entitled Racism in the Criminal Justice System, I guess, is just, I was alluding to what the person's comment was earlier. Mm -hmm. but. Some of the things I was, I was wondering about is first, why don't you go back and do like these gentlemen are saying over here, is go through either some of the things that Will Banks did or Amsterdam did. I mean, you, you kept referring back to studies without telling us what the studies were, and you, you, and you keep showing us 1980 data. And I wondered, since you know National Institute of Justice, Bureau of Justice Studies, et cetera, you can get data that's, that's pretty recent, um, why you used 10-year-old uh, data uh, I guess I'll just stop with that. Well, I, I, it's, it's much easier if you have substantive comments to make. I mean, like, for example, Will Bank's study is all about racism in the criminal justice system. As I said, I find that kind of an uninteresting topic because I'm much more interested in racism in society. Uh, and furthermore, Will Banks' study has been challenged by, you know, hundreds of people. And I think that even that study is totally unclear. But it, it's just not that interesting to me. And I didn't discuss anywhere in here, in my presentation, the racism of the criminal justice system. I, I was discussing, I, or I was trying to discuss, the racism of society. Um, with respect to the data, I have a paper here which 
you can take, which contains references and uh, some later data. Uh, some of this has to do with the expense of the slides, as I asserted. And if you would like to challenge it or have any, any evidence, I, I, you could tell us all and help us that although some of the numbers are a little bit old, none of the relationships have changed at all. Um, so as I said, you know, international imprisonment rates, for example, are very hard to find. And I've never seen a complete set like that. Again, I would love to. What happens is, you know, I'll be reading something, I'll come, along, come across one country and read another thing, and come across, across two other countries, and one thing is 1983, and the other thing is 1985. And it's been very hard for me to gather, say, that comparably. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I try to present you all here this evening, you know, with, I think, a drastic political argument, which I think certainly deserves challenge and refutation, although it's what I believe in the best I could do. But I tell you as honestly as I can, I mean, you have no reason to believe me, you don't know me, that the numbers are true. I mean, I, I, I am professionally a statistician. I'm used to dealing with numbers. Now, I, I, I've done the best I can not to, you know, deceive you with the numbers, but politically, you know, that could, you could easily have an argument on that. Yeah? Well, as speaking maybe for more than one in the audience, with you up there presenting your ideas, you have a focus. What is it that you want us in the audience to do in response to what you've presented? Well, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I can tell you, I think it is the responsibility of every white person to fight racism every day in every way. And I think there are any numbers of ways in which we could do that. See, I think that not only because that's what prisons are about, but because I think it is through that process that we have a chance of generating a human society, something I think we don't have now. I myself, I, you know, I work in this group called the Committee to End the Marion Lockdown, which is about prisons. And many of these formulations are not just mine. I mean, they're, you know, they're things that the whole committee has evolved together over the years. We have lots of literature, which you can see. Uh, gain reference to it, I brought a few things, and this is a copy, this lists our resources. Um, and I, there are any number of ways. I don't know what to do, to be honest, you know, to change things. But I do know that things need to change, and I think that it is especially incumbent. See, I believe that, you know, black people are going to do what they need to do. And they're going to pursue their own agenda, and quite naturally it will be their freedom from racism and, and freedom beyond from other restrictions. And they'll do that as as however they see fit. But I think what, what I have to address myself is how do I, as a white person, uh, interact in that process? You know, how do I work to also bring about an improved society? And, and I mean, that's not much of an answer, but that's the best I know. What are you doing in regard to the lockdown? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, concrete activity toward uh, one mm -hmm. of the objectives, which is. Well, we're, we, we are. Um, an activist organization. Um, we have lots of literature, lots of uh, information. We have demonstrations often <clears throat> down in southern Illinois at Marion Prison, sometimes in Chicago. Um, recently we had a campaign and we had friends in, in seven different chapters and we had simultaneous demonstrations on this past May 5th in, in Portland, in San Francisco, in Denver, you know, many cities like that to try to bring our message across. In this particular instance, um, prisoners at Marion were being forced to use water from a lake that was contaminated with PCBs and other serious contaminants. And for years they had been fighting that and right after the demonstration the Bureau of Prisons announced that they would be changing the water supply. So that was one very small victory that we won. I mean, Marion is still there, it's still brutal. And as I mentioned earlier, they're now planning a bigger and better prison, you know, in, in Colorado. We're a small group of people, you know, th there's, I don't know what the answers are, but I do think we have to try and, and strive in that direction. Um, I, I don't know what your views are, because you didn't say anything about the news media and how they handled situations like this. <clears throat> well, one thing, I've noticed, having worked in the news media and I'm currently working in it, is that in a situation with the, uh, the lady in New York, the jogger incident, right. mm -hmm. um, you know, those, those kids got put through the ringer right. by the news media. I, I think mainly, so. 
the main reason was because I think because they were black mm -hmm. and she was a white jogger. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you were to reverse that, and it was a black woman jogging and four white males, I don't think it would have been, you mm -hmm. know, you made the first two or three pages of the newspaper. Right. But along the same respects, if a white policeman shoots a black um, kid, you know, not knowing what situation necessarily, but just the, the um, general statement, that receives more attention and is built, you know, it's automatically we're thinking discrimination there and a racist cop where if a black cop shoots a white kid you don't you know hear nothing about it and it's you know not put it you know it's that's just the way it is handled in the news media and I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Well I'm sorry I didn't mean to cut you off that's thing. But just just try to look at the situation in Ames. Four people have been raped in Ames, more or less, since the beginning of the semester. Okay now the four people that did it, or if it was just one person, have all been described as white males. And the police are doing basically nothing about it. There was a, a big rally about this last Friday. The police are doing nothing about it. Oh, yeah. Okay, but if it was a black person, if, the, if there was a, the even slightest chance that the person who did that, those, those rapes, were black, every black male in Ames would have been kicked in the head at least three times. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. So I, I but, mean, there's, but I agree with that, and I think that's wrong. But, you know, there's also that reverse of it, too, that, you know, we always hear. I, I don't, I, I come from Chicago, mm -hmm. and I live there every year of my life, except for while I'm here at Iowa State. And I don't ever remember hearing of a black police officer shooting a white kid. I've never heard of that. Well, never. Neither have I. <laughs> but... Yeah. See, let me just, with respect to the larger issue, I, I, Steve, you come next. With, with respect to the larger issue, Remember, I started, I don't know what was clear, or I can't even, to be honest, quite remember fully what I said. But I believe that we, we have the, the physical reality of prisons and who's in them and stuff like that, which I tried to, to explain to you. Um, but more important than that, we have these ideological binders, you know, that are placed upon us all, so that the only solution to virtually every social problem sounds like it's prison. You know, Lyndon Johnson did the war on crime, and Bush now has the war on drugs. You know, I mean, they should just stop and say it's the war on black people. You know, then at least no one would, would be confused and we could get down to dealing with what needs to be dealt with. The, the ideological boundaries in the United States are very tightly drawn. I, I just, there's one very quick anecdote. Some of you may have heard of Noam Chomsky. He, he writes a lot of stuff. Anyway, he, he, he is a crit critic of the media. And he wrote this article uh, uh, several years ago. A Soviet journalist was put in prison because for three or four shows in a row, he had criticized the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And hundreds of journalists in the United States rose to that journalist's defense. And Chomsky said that that was a good thing to do, and they were right. But a more important question is, why has there never been one journalist in the United States who's talked about the U.S. invasion of Vietnam. You know, he wrote this several years ago. He could just as well today say, why hasn't anyone, when we're talking about you know, the invasion of Kuwait, how come no one's talking about the invasion of Panama, for example? Well, Chomsky said, but this is much more remarkable because you could understand Soviet journalists being afraid to say that you know, because they wind up in prison. But why is it that no U.S. journalist will ever say that, Chomsky asked. And his answer was because our media are self-censoring. You know, they understand the boundaries. They inculcated the values of what the government wants us to believe. And they pass that down to us over and over and over again. So part of what I'm thinking about these days, and you know, one nice aspect of, of, of getting a chance to talk to people like this, for me, is that you try to figure out, you know, how to say things you're feeling and thinking and how to make a good argument for them, but is that we have to overcome these ideological blinders that are placed upon us. They're placed upon us in part by the media, but also the media themselves wear them. You know, I, I don't know how we get them to break with that, you know? I mean, uh, you know, for, for a start, we might have some black news reporters and some black 
editors and some black publishers, you know, and I mean, that would be a beginning, but there are hundreds of other ways one could think about it. But as Steve said back there, you know, I mean, it's, they all get fired immediately. You know, so, and, did, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to add something, Steve, is that, because um, I think you do real well with the civil rights, the idea that the system does repress and discriminate against African Americans. But also, I think it's important for white people to realize this, is that what you showed is that the rate of incarceration has gone up 300% in the last 10 years, the last 20 years. That we have the highest rate of incarceration, the longest prison sentences, and the biggest prison population of any country in the Western industrial world. And that although it's overwhelmingly black, 50% or more black, for white people to remember, it's 50% white too. And, and that rate is going up. And it's, and it's impacting severely on the black community but it's also impacting on the white community because we are losing freedom. As you said, it's ideological. We are becoming a rigidified society. We're afraid to speak out anymore. This drug war, this, 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 this we're even afraid to, to, to be politically free anymore. And I, if young people don't realize it, but when I look back on what things were like in the 60s, how much freer we were 20 right. years ago, mm -hmm how much more free we were to express ourselves 20 years ago. And I think 1990 is becoming scary almost, how, how inhibited people are, particularly this generation, because they didn't grow up in the freedom we knew in the 60s. Let me, uh, there's one hand up, I'd like to, call, no, okay. Let me ask, I, I often, you know, sometimes I talk and sometimes I'm in the audience and I notice that there's always a lot of people who I know are thinking a lot of things and and don't say them. So if there are people who haven't spoken yet and you know, would like to ask questions or make comments, and don't feel bad about arguing with me, I mean, I, yeah, that's fine also. Yes? You said uh, Mr. Bush is using this uh, drug war to, as a racist tactic against blacks. And do you think it's really that or more just a political weapon to reinforce the might is right attitude in the American public and get him reelected? Great. I mean, I can't really see this in, as using it directly as in a racial. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I, I I sort of I agree with you a lot. I mean, I would say it's both. I don't know which one I would say it's more, but it's absolutely a lot of what you're saying. I mean, this, there's this very interesting debate that takes place. I think among you know the eight people who think about these topics, <laughs> and and that is whether, for example. Uh, attacks against black people are more efforts to physically control black people or to ideologically control white people. You know, I mean, like for example, people have written historical studies saying that one of the fundamental purposes or functions of slave catching was not so much to, re to bring the slaves back, although that was certainly it, but to keep the poor white people in line and give them something to do. You know, so in the same way, I would say that this, you know, this war on drugs is absolutely a political maneuver, you know, designed to gain power for Bush. I've seen studies, for example, you know, people may not know this, but drug use apparently is at a 10-year low. It was at its high in, in 1979, has been decreasing ever since. When Bush came into office for, for weeks and months on end, they did a survey, which they always do, and they say, what's the number one problem confronting you? And everybody, you know, the public would overwhelmingly say the economy. And then Bush began screaming drugs, 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 drugs. And after a couple of weeks, people started saying, well, it's drugs that's the number one problem. You know, and so the reality hadn't changed at all, just the ideological shift and, and, and the charge. So I really agree with you. I, I myself would like to take what you say as a friendly amendment and not try to judge which is more the purpose. Uh, on the other hand, there's no other group of people that the war on drugs could be waged. I, I mean, it, you know, it's not like it could be waged on students or, you know, people who live in Iowa or when, you know, it's not, I mean, you know, there's it, only one way you could wage that war, so, yeah. So, no, so are you saying that the war on drugs is, has no redeeming qualities, that he's just doing it to gain political enormity and, and the only reason he's doing it is for himself to get in, back into office again? That, you know, and sure, drug drug use has gone down, but also the uh, 
effects of drugs and the new drugs that are out has gotten worse with you know the introduction of crack. Mm -hmm. You know, more people are dying now because of that. And, you know, some people want to stop that. What's right. wrong with that? Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that everybody knows that the war on drugs has absolutely nothing to do with stopping the problems of drugs, just like prisons have nothing to do with stopping the problems of crime. I, I mean, you know, every fact I know and have seen points in that direction. I, I agree. I don't mean to minimize the problem of drugs. I think it's terrible and very serious. I'm just saying, why now is it being instituted? You know, and, and you have to look and try to wonder, not only instituted, but why in this strange way? I mean, Bush is being criticized by wardens and sheriffs even are saying, look, you know, you're crazy because all you're doing is putting more people in prison and we know that has nothing to do with stopping the war on drugs. I mean, what about prevention? I just saw, I'll get you in a second. I just saw this study, you know, I, I work at the Center for Urban Affairs. Someone just did this study, I can't remember now in, in what city, but they went and asked, you know, crack dealers, what would make you stop? and they said a $12 an hour job. Now, I don't know if they were telling the truth, but I'm inclined to believe something like that. They didn't say, what salary would you need in a job to stop? They said, what would make you stop? And I think they thought maybe they were gonna say the death penalty or something like that. You know, and these people said $12 an hour and I'll stop. Now, if that's the case, why would you build more prisons? I mean, that's intuitively what I would suspect. That's what Nagel says up there. So what's the purpose of more prisons and more guns and you know, this madman William Bennett, you know, running the program. I mean, none of that makes any sense. So it's not, I mean, I'm sorry if I gave that impression. I'm in favor of, of, of dealing with the drug problem. I just don't think that the war on drugs has anything to do with it at all. Yes, you? All right, I'm talking about the war on drugs. How difficult would it be for a country the size of the United States to stop drugs from coming in from its borders? It only, it comes in from probably the Mexican border comes in through Florida, comes in through California, basically. Now, how hard would it actually be if the war on drugs really was the war on drugs for America to stop drugs from coming in? And America, in the past, has had no problem with going into some country and taking it over, <coughs> Vietnam, uh, Saudi Arabia, or wherever. We've had, we've had no problems in the past with going in and doing what we please in the name of democracy or whatever it is. They, they claimed it was right at that time. So we could go down to San Salvador, El Salvador, Ecuador, wherever the drugs are coming from and stop it right at its source if that was a true, true thing. And I agree totally with what you say, the war on drugs has nothing to do with drugs at all. Uh, drugs are introduced into black communities by white people. And now it's just got, it's gotten to the point where it's affecting more white people than black people now. So now they figure that, well, maybe we should say there's a war on drugs, but really, if we lose a few white people to stop all the black people, then that's okay too. Are you saying that it looks like we're more racist now than we were shortly after the Civil Rights Revolution? Or what, was there the ratio of whites to blacks and the, uh, the more black, blacks in prison, about the same ratio that they are now? It's then? gotten a little higher. I mean, it depends when you, when you say the end was, but it's gotten a little higher, but you see what happens when there's a big ratio and then things increase equal. So the ratio stays the same, but the absolute numbers become overwhelming. Do you know what I mean? So although the ratio, I think maybe then it was five and a half or six to one, and now maybe it's eight to one, say. You know, so the ratio hasn't changed that much, but the numbers are so overwhelming, you know, that it, I mean, it really, it's, it's like, you know, we're dev one out of four, you know, we're just, the whole community is just being devastated. Um, is it the judicial system that just feels that the, the idea is to put more people in jail? Because I don't see anybody asking me if I want more prisons. I'm sorry, say that sentence again. I don't see anybody asking me if I want more prisons. It just seems that more prisons seem to happen. We're just <laughs> cycle that we get more prosecutions, more imprisonment, more prisons. And, uh, right, I think. And the crime rate seems to be less. Like yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know much about how the funding takes place. In, in some states, there are specific initiatives in support of, you know, bond, bonds have to be issued for prison <coughs> construction. So those are put to the public. In other cases, for example, I think the way it happens and filters down to us is that there are law and order candidates. You know, for example, you know, Bush did this thing with the Willie Horton stuff, and, and, and I think people think that carried the election, I don't know. But you see, I think what Dukakis would have had to do is to tell the truth 
about prisons and crime and all of that, and he clearly wasn't about to start that. And, and you know, so he was left then with no response. You know, Bush is saying lock up everybody in the United States, especially black people, and Dukakis is saying nah, just most people. And then you know, so it, it doesn't. You know, it's not a real way to argue the the question. And uh, I don't know. I don't know who gets asked this, but I think it's undeniable we're living in an, in an era of law and order hysteria, and. Um, I don't know quite how it gets combated. That's what I was trying, you know, to do today was, was suggest that that was a problem. You see? Oh, yeah. Good point. Uh, you mentioned before that it cost a million dollars to keep someone in prison for 30 years, oh. and that $12 an hour job, right. taxable income right. for 30 years is 750,000. Uh huh. So we could easily, yeah. In fact, so could you? Did everyone hear what she said? It was a great observation. It, it was that. You, if you paid someone twelve dollars an hour for thirty years, it would be less than the cost of keeping them in prison. A forty-hour week. For a forty-hour week, it's also a fact. Keep your hand up, but I want to call you. It's also a fact, by the way, that it costs much more to send a person to prison for a year than to Harvard. Yeah. yeah that's assuming they want to go to Harvard for right. a year. That's assuming they want to work forty hours a week. Right. We can't assume that over, you know, right. everyone who's in the penitentiaries. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. But would you think it's some fair proportion? Sorry? Would you think it's some fair proportion? I agree entirely with you, but probably it's some fair proportion, right? I mean, I, I don't know. You know, for ex I mean, that's just speculation. I don't really know, but... Along the lines of an alternative, I mean, don't you, don't you think that you have to think of something? I mean, if you're going to try and change somebody's mind on something, you can't just go and tell them that this is wrong. And that this isn't working, you got to go. It's not working, but you know we've got to try something else. Here's my plan. Here's something I've come up with as an idea. You just can't mm -hmm. go up to somebody and say it's not working. Right. You got to you got to change it. You, you know, let me tell you. I'm, I'm I'm sorry to admit this because I I was telling them earlier. You know, it, I was always told if if you have slides and you're more than 50 miles from home, then that's the definition of being an expert. So I, I you know I have slides and I'm 50 miles from home, so I'm standing in front of you. But, I, you know, I'm not that smart. I mean, that's the painful reality. And um, I'd be glad to sit down with you and many others to figure out how to go about it. I mean, I have a few raggedy ideas that I could tell you. But I just, the truth is, I don't know the answer. I do know that I believe strongly what Nagel says, that, you know, social inequality and crime is there, and prisons are there, and they have nothing to do with each other. And turning our attention there to deal with that problem is a meaningless, wasted effort for society and is totally destructive uh, of anybody who winds up going into the, the prison system. So I know that's one place to start. You know, her calculation was just brilliant. I'm going to put it in my talk next time, share my honorarium with you. But, you know, <laughs> but I mean, that, you know, for example, that would be a great idea to, you know, say somebody's about to go in to prison and say that the person is not, you know, someone really threatening. I mean, we could discuss what that meant. I mean, you might say to the person, look, we'll either put you in prison or you have to promise to go to work every day this year for 40 hours a week. Uh, if you do, we'll play, pay you $12 an hour. You know, and if you really mess up, we'll put you back in prison. I mean, that would be awesome because then the person would pay taxes and, you know, and, and not go to prison and save money. Create another job for the person who has to watch over them. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, Bill? I'm sorry. Just part, part of the answer that I would give to your, to your question about what, al what alternatives there are, uh, I think we need to start looking at, I mean, given the failures of, of the present system of retributive justice, of punishment, uh, which not only makes, I mean, it doesn't deal with the victim at all. The victim is basically ignored. You might get some, I guess, satisfaction out of knowing that somebody else is suffering that, that made you suffer. Uh, but I mean, that's that's not doing much more than still being a victim. Uh, and given the fact that what this system does is make offenders into victims as well uh, because of their long prison sentences and the type of treatment that they that they face in there. I think we need to move from that kind of system to uh, more of a restorative type of justice. Uh, one in which 
we look at the situation, look at the crime, and figure out how to get the situation back to where it was as, as much as possible before the, the crime was committed. And that means, it may mean sitting the offender and, and the victim down and, and figuring that out through mediation. It could mean uh, restitution, it could mean a lot of things. But it does make a lot more sense than what we've got now, uh, and it would be cheaper. But what about repeat offenders? And, I mean, if somebody does that, and they sit down with the family, you know, they stole something from them or whatever, they sit down with them and they say, okay, I'll work for you, you know, to help pay back, you know, what I, you know, maybe they did something to their house or whatever. You know, they sit down with them, they, they work this out, the person works for them, it's all paid off, person goes on, does it again, sits down with the family, works it off, you know. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that you need to look at is why, you know, why is, why is the crime being committed? And there are, there are, I mean, there are a wide variety of crimes and you can't generalize, but I mean, if it's a, if it's a, if you're talking about theft, if you're talking about property crime, the odds are that it has something to do with poverty, with unemployment, uh, with either lack of education or lack of job skills. And so, I mean, I think you need to look at causes in that way and, and figure out more than just the, the immediate situation, but, but the broader social picture. And, and unless we do that, uh, you're right, that, that, that the causes are still gonna be there. Steve? You gotta rebuild the South Bronx, South Detroit, Newark. You gotta rebuild the west side of Chicago and the south side. You gotta take billions of dollars away from the military and start pouring it back into the inner cities. Rebuilding the housing projects, giving people a right to a way to own a house, rebuilding their schools, take the damn bars off the windows in the grade schools, rebuild the subway systems, put people to work, <coughs> constructive employment. That's the way you get at lowering the crime rate. The last thing to say is, what we already know about the 1990s and the year 2000 is, because of all these damn prisons that they've been building, we know that the crime rate's gonna skyrocket beyond anything we even know. Because when all these people that we've sent to prison in the 70s and the 80s, when they get out of prison, as they will, in the 90s and the year 2000, you're gonna have skyrocket. Prison. You're going to have more crime than we ever dreamed. Because if you, once you send people to prison, you fabricate them into criminals. And the only solution we have is burn down the prisons, tear them down, knock them down, and start building houses, schools, hospitals, jobs, rebuild the cities. That's the only solution. And anybody here knows it. Most if you, all you gotta do is go to South Side of Detroit, South Side of Chicago, look at the slums and look at the ghettos. That's why we have crime. I think what Steve is saying is that both of us are sociologists, and sociologists have been studying this issue for several generations, and we know the the, the answers. Um, the answers are there. It's nothing that is radical here, but there. Are, is a case where policymakers have no desire to listen to social scientists who can tell them the sort of thing. It doesn't, doesn't fit into their, into their system. Yeah. So there's a divergence between policymakers and the social scientists. Yeah. Did you want to say? Well, yeah, I agree with you. We need to rebuild the, the inner cities and the social economics is a cause for um, crime, but I don't want rapists, murderers, I don't want them running around in houses and hospitals, I want them behind bars. I feel much better myself with that, you know. Right. Well, I, I agree with a lot of that sentiment. I mean, of course, I agree with the formulation as you've posed it, uh, and I don't know what you do in the middle of a crazy situation, you know. I mean, that's real hard uh, to figure out how to get out of it, in a sense. Uh, there, there are hundreds of subtleties of your formulation we could discuss. I mean, for example, most people who m murder, you know, do it only once. And in fact, 
it, it might be interesting to know that they do it against family members, you know, not against the public at large. And that, in fact, this is such a well-known fact that insurance for murderers, like if, you, if people go to work, you know, you get insurance against damage they would do when you hire them. And it's lowest for murderers than for any other ex-offenders, you know, because they're sort of the safest people uh, once they've committed their initial murder. So, I mean, one would have to think of the subtleties of it. Do, do you know what I mean? I mean, I mean, you don't believe me, but... Yeah, <laughs> but, make me feel any better, though. Well, I know, <laughs> but, but the, anyway, all I'm saying is, I, I agree, though, I mean, there are a lot of people who are incredibly messed up. The, the situation is, and there are a lot of people in prison, by the way, who aren't. <laughs> I mean, they're both. And the situation is, what do we do today to begin to get out of the bind? You know, I mean, that's, that's the question. And, and I think, you know, that's what Steve, and I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but the man behind him was addressing. You know, if anything, you're, the strength of your suggestion that we really do know the answers, and, and I mean, it, it makes sense to me that you all do, speaks further and further reinforces uh, sort of my proposed reconceptualization. I mean, although maybe with Steve's modification, that, that is, I do think people really do know the answers. You know, I mean, I mean they're, and they're along the lines that have been discussed. And, and the spectacular refusal to pay them any mind year after year after year, you know, suggests that this is not an accident. You know, that people are, are doing it sort of on purpose. You know, it's funny because I showed you that quote from Curry. I don't know if you remember, but it says, you know, if we know so much, how come we're not doing better at it? And he goes on. And it's funny because Curry's a very progressive person, and I really like his book. You know what Curry's answer is about why we're not doing better? It's because the research that shows that prisons fail is hard to understand. Now, if you stop to think about it, it's, so, it's ludicrous. The book is excellent, but this one explanation is absolutely ludicrous. Here's an industry or an institution with an annual budget of $25 billion a year. And Curry is saying the only answer Curry could think of about why we're not doing better is that the research is hard to understand. You know, I mean, there is no, I mean, if, I think if you examine it the way, you know, I try to suggest it, you won't be able to find a reason why we don't change the system that is not consistent, you know, with sort of the point of view that I set forward. I mean, we don't change the system because it's doing what we want. That is, it's containing ungovernable <coughs> sectors or something like that. Yeah. Here's how I would respond to them. I, I, again, I don't know. You know, I said a lot of words, and I'm really not quite sure what I always say. But what, I, I didn't mean to say that we're committing genocide by putting blacks in prison. I showed lots of conditions of life. You know, remember I had those, those ten items about the living conditions of black people in society. And what I wanted to say was when you combine that with the nature of imprisonment, with many other things that we all know about that go on every day, that all of those together constitute genocide, not just that the imprisonment does. That's yeah, but then why does that have to do with the whole pot? I mean, why well, does that make it? Well, because what I was trying to do was, was build up to the fact that if you have a society that has a racist structure, you clearly have uh, people who are not going to like to be part of that society and who are going to, in any number of ways, rebel against it. 
Uh, we can respond in either of two ways, by addressing the inequalities that have generated the rebellion, or by putting people in prison. You know, we've done the second, and that's what I, I think we shouldn't be doing. Well, one would have to. Th well, that's all right. I mean, I think you're asking good questions. I mean, one would just have to think about it. I mean, I, I mean, women, you know, I, I don't know quite how far to get off. You, you should think about it. I mean, for example, is the position of women in society like the position of black people in society? I mean, you know, do like say, let's talk about white women for a second. I mean, do white women have the same, you know, life expectancy? Do white babies have the same infant mortality rate? Do white women have the same kind of money at their disposal as black people? I mean, you know, you could go on and, I mean, you know, on and on and on like that in many ways. I, by the way, I think women are terribly oppressed in society, and I oppose that oppression as best I can. I'm not speaking against it. I just mean if you're trying to figure out how that winds up, you know, with respect to prisons, I think it's a complex story that, that one needs to think about. The other thing is I want to, I know this is complicated, and I myself don't know how to untangle it when I speak, but I've tried real hard today not to talk about whether the criminal justice system is racist. I think that's an interesting question, and we could talk about it if you want. But to me, it's less interesting and much less important than whether society is racist. See, even if it is true that black people commit more crimes, and that's why they go to prison more, and I think it's sort of true and sort of not true, not nearly true as much as they go to prison more, that to me, then you have to say, why? What kind of a society have we created that generates that situation? And as I said to a question back here, I think you know, there are lots of different kinds of answers, but in the end, they all fall into two categories. Either we have a racist society that generates the conditions that lead to that situation, that is, more crime in society, or black people are genetically predisposed to crime. Now, I'm, as I said, you can say things different ways, but I think you know if you wrote down all the explanations, you really could could factor those two into into those two broad categories. And I certainly don't believe it's the genetic explanation. And then I think it's even a more powerful indictment. You see, if it's just, if it's the racism of society rather than the racism of the criminal justice system, because that I think you know calls for even greater self-examination of what we're about. <laughs> I'm sorry, we could, see, just a second. Did you want to answer that, please? I mean, no, I, no, no. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, sir. Um, something that comes to mind is the best estimate of violent crime in terms of convicts is that only 15% of the prison population was convicted of a violent crime, be it murder, rape, or assault. 85% of the people that are in penitentiaries are there for property crimes, like stealing a car, writing bad checks, or selling marijuana. Those are proxies. Those people are not a threat to you on the street. 85% of the people. So theoretically, you could do away with 80 or 85% of all prisons and still keep locked up, at least for some period of time, people that have committed violent offenses, like assault, robbery, uh, armed robbery, murder, and rape. The what I'm trying to suggest is many people go to prison and spend many years there for nonviolent crimes. We should maybe okay. let people break and then maybe show the films for those who want to stay. Okay. Or maybe one more question or comment. Well, <coughs> how about if, is there anyone, one last comment? Okay, well, let's. let's okay. Uh, I want well, to. Yes, uh, oh, yeah, great. Scott Kern, it was addressed a little while ago. The gentleman down here said something about security not doing anything about the rapes on campus because the description was of a white man. I work with security on, on campus. And I can tell you that we are doing something and uh, on the average weekend night right now, there are twice as many, in my associate, the area that I work anyway, there are twice as many guards on duty as there was on that night last last year. But we are doing something. I think he was addressing the, the looking for them. We are not, not what you're doing to prevent them anymore, but actually going out trying to find these we're, people. We're looking for, we but have are you, are you in, like a Friley or RCA security? Yeah, I'm an RCA security. Well, you're not directly involved with an investigation, then you don't. We have, they've given us descriptions. We're looking for who we can find, but we don't have anything. Right, but you're not good. a detective, we're you're just a, you know, I'm not trying to put you down, well, but I'm just saying you're just they a student watching. <coughs> 
As, as RCA security, do we communicate with ISV security and with names? And they are doing something. They're, they are looking for them. We aren't active. No, I'm not actively involved in an investigation, but they've given us the information. They've got, we are eyes and ears for them a lot of the time. And they have us looking for what we can find. And, and they are working on it, but there's, they can only do so much. And it doesn't have anything. If there's no leads, they can't go after a person, no matter who it is, what color they are, where they come from. Okay. Well, I, listen, I, I didn't mean to, to stop there.